This episode of Planet Noun contains some discussions and words that may not be suitable for your young'uns. A couple of the words may be objectionable to grown folks, but it's part of a discussion about a work of fiction, about a work of art. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. Welcome to Planet Noun, where it's all about the people, places, things, and ideas that teach us, prompt us to make a difference, and to do more with what life presents. So it's the end of February, and there's a lot going on in these 28 days, from Black History Month to President's Day to Valentine's Day. And any day is a good day to profess affection, 24-7, 365. So look, I admit it, I am in love with some books, y'all. And there's this character. Her name is Eloise Norton. She's captured my heart. Why? Honey, because she is so human and it's like I know her. So look, I am so stoked that I got to interview her creator while I was in Los Angeles visiting my folks. Critically acclaimed fiction writer, Rachel Housel Hall, y'all. She is author of several books, including the Lou Norton series and another title, They All Fall Down, which will be released this April. So before taking an extended visit to Los Angeles to spend some extra time with my family, you know, during the holidays, and I reached out to see if she'd be available for an interview. Everything worked out. We met up at an awesome local health food spot to chat on the patio. Coffee was her beverage of choice, and I, well, I was happy to be away from the D.C. winter, so I was sipping on some peachy, banana-flavored smoothie thingy. It was such a beautiful sunny day, and folks chatting at nearby tables and buses passing down Slauson. It was nice. So come along, sit with us for our interview where we start talking about the foundations of her writing career. Planet Noun, episode 15 with Rachel Halzell Hall. I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was very young. I would say around kindergarten and I would take anything that belonged to my older brother and I would just write on it. Um, I was also the kid who would make lists. I would make lists of commercials on TV. I would sit in a car and think of states and their capitals. I was always writing. And I still actually have my first story I wrote. It was in third grade called Blue Monday. And just like all my stories, it had a very somber, sad, my life kind of sucks. And uh, the ending was a morose little girl not having a good Monday. So I... I always had that in me, and I loved words. I loved books, and there was one Christmas I didn't get. I can't remember what book it was, but I didn't get it for Christmas, and I cried. And, of course, my parents were like, what is wrong with you? You got everything else, but you didn't get books. Are you crazy? And, yes, yes, I was crazy because (laughs) that's, that's what I liked. That's what I loved. So when it was time for me to go to college, and I told them that I wanted to be an English American lit major, they're like, of course you do. That's what you do. And so that's, that was my road. I didn't know really that I could actually be a writer because back then, you know, the stories had to be heavy. Alice Walker and Audre Lorde and these women who told these important big stories. And the stories I wanted to tell weren't those stories. And it wasn't until Terry McMillan and Walter Mosley came out, one with um, Waiting to Excel and, of course, uh, Devil in a Blue Dress, where I saw myself kind of fitting in a space that wasn't, you know, Alice Walker and Toni Morrison. And that's when I tried it. And here I am. When did it dawn on you that you're really good at writing? Because sometimes, you know, once upon a time I wanted to be X, Y, Z, but I was no good at it and then switched to something else. So when did it dawn on you that you were really, really good at this, that you are really, really good at this? This morning. <laughs> no, it's one of those things where, like any creative, you feel like like you're a fraud. You, you, that you just happen to do this one thing and you don't get it in again. I'm starting a new story. I started it this morning and I'm looking at blank notepads. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. And this would be my maybe 10th novel that I've started. And it's still kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I knew that I was gifted in writing I would say in elementary school because back then they tracked kids and I sucked at math but I was really good in English and art and music so I knew that there was something there and I knew that I had a natural propensity for writing because I kept journals I actually still have all my journals starting in I think it was fourth or fifth grade and I read some of the stuff I'm like oh that's a great little story it's my life but 
I had something. I had a sense of character and how things should end. I would say that when I landed my first agent, I knew that there was something that I was doing that other people weren't doing. That was kind of like, uh, yeah, you, you, you can do this thing. And I would say, you know, whenever I get a great review, that's, and, and the reviewer actually says something that no one else has said and catches this trick I did, that's when I'm like, oh, yeah, I did that. But then you go back to feeling like a fraud again. So it's this pendulum, pendulum of I suck and wow, I'm damn good. Do you think you'll ever really get over that or it's just part of the cycle, part of the process? I think that's just part of the process. Um, writers tend to be neurotic people who are always living in their heads and always projecting and making stories. And for a mystery crime writer, I'm always making bad stories. So, of course, my natural tendency is to go toward the dark. And so with myself. And, you know, there's also this thing where, and this is not just art, but anything, where we compare our trajectory to other people's. And it's like, I've never won an award. Does that mean that I'm not a good writer? Sometimes I feel that way. Most times I don't feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's something I think I will always battle and something that will always keep me humble. And, you know, it wasn't until last year where I actually felt comfortable enough to start teaching it. I, I, it was my year saying yes last year. And for the first time, I taught writing because for a long time, I didn't think I knew anything. And it wasn't until my husband was like, you know a lot of stuff about writing. You've been doing this for almost all your life. And then when I started doing it, it's like, I do know something. But then after that class, I'm like, I don't know anything. Help me, <laughs> Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. So, yeah. Yeah. So when you said year of yes, that was in reference to the Shonda Rhimes book? Yes, yes, yes. And also, you know, getting older, I'm trying to do things that I wouldn't normally be comfortable doing, just out of fear, out of fear of failure. And I thought it would be cool. As I'm looking toward retirement, I want to start doing things that I know I can do during retirement. So teaching writing class is something I can do as a, as a hustle when I retire. And I like it. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, yeah, I taught... I led one, two, three, four or five uh, writing workshops. And while it was exhausting, it was exhilarating. And I hope that people got something out of it. So, Do you have any more coming up? Not this year, but it is... Er, well, no, that's a lie. Yes, one in May at the Pikes Peak Writers Conference and in August at the Book Passage Mystery Conference. So, yeah, those are two so far. I just did a little Googling and I found something called Riding in My Car. Riding in My Car. <laughs> and so this list of writer's fears, now that you're about nine or ten books in, um, what do you, how do you grapple with your writer's fears, talking about that cycle? Is this too smart? Is it too dumb? All of these things, all these questions. And I remember thinking, every time I sit down to write an article for work, <laughs> I think the same thing. Yeah. It's, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, again, it just never goes away. Um, one thing that I've honed better is, will anyone care about this story? And I actually had started on a story in November. And usually when I write, because I have a full-time job, I don't get to write full-time. So I'm usually excited when I go to my stories. And while I was writing it, I wasn't excited. And then I figured, I don't care about these people. And if I don't care about these people, who will? So I've only, and I stopped. I stopped writing it, and I trunked it because I will come back to it later somehow, and it will become a story that I actually care about. So that's one thing that took me some time to learn, stopping when it's not working. Usually, you know, a younger baby writer, I keep pushing until I finish the first draft just so I can say I finished it. But I'm realizing I don't have time like that. Um, my daughter is in high school. Uh, she has things and places for me to go. I'm getting older, so I'm getting more tired. I can't get up as early sometimes in the morning as I usually do. So 
you know, I had to start curating my time better. And so by being able to recognize that this story isn't working because I don't care about it and being okay with stepping away from it, you know, it's one of those writer's fears. It's like, well, what am I going to do? I know now that that story isn't going away. I'm going to take it and make it into something else, take parts of it. It's my story, so I can do whatever I want with it. It's kind of like um, learning when you're a reader that you don't have to finish this book that you're hating. It took me forever to say, I'm not going to finish this book. This book sucks, and I'm going to throw it across the room. Now, I'm like, I'm not going to finish this. There are thousands of other stories that I want to read and get to, and I'm okay with that. I'm still working on that without the guilt. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. And you do feel guilty, but now I don't. And, I, you know, like my stories, it's like, well, I'll come back to it if I need to. Until then, I'm going to read this story over here that I couldn't wait to purchase and find out what's going on in that world. So, yeah. so that's how I felt about, uh, still feel about uh, Eloise Norton. Aww. What makes you, um, what are some of the things that you care most about Eloise Norton? Because she, she's words on a page, but she, she could step out of a book and walk down Slauson. <laughs> you know, that's how I feel about when I, you know, when I read about Lou. Well, I wanted to, when, when I created her, it was um, right after my second bout with um, facing cancer. And I was trying to figure out what are those things I want to do before I die because mortality was heavy on my mind. And I wanted to, I had been creeping more and more toward mystery and crime with each, you know, with each draft of another novel. And I finally said to myself, one, I want to buy a Mercedes Benz, which I did because that was my survivor's gift. And then I wanted to create that character who is me, braver than me, but who's me or my friends, the women that I loved and grew up with, who came from a part of Los Angeles that you don't get to see really in books and movies and TV, who is committed to something, but also likes shoes and barbecue ribs and hanging out with her girlfriends, who makes her mom proud and disappoints her mom too. So I wanted to write this fully formed young black woman in my part of Los Angeles who did things for people who are still a part of her community but not. So in a no man's land. And that's who Lou became. And I wanted her to be able to uh, traverse a landscape that you know many of us in this part of Los Angeles that we're familiar with. The boy that we grew up with in elementary school who may or may not be in jail right now or the girl who would bully you and is now you know pregnant and bitter so I wanted her to explore all those spaces that we're familiar with and I I I love her she's um she's funny um she's not perfect uh I didn't want her to be perfect I wanted her to be strong and interesting but vulnerable and that's why I gave her a relationship that wasn't entirely healthy um, I've had people say she's so strong well why is she with that guy it's like well how many women do we know who have it together at the office and then come home to a total mess because for whatever reason and so I wanted that I wanted her to have that and I wanted her to have um, her friendships her girlfriends and I wanted her to feel um, frustrated at work because a lot of us are frustrated at work. Sometimes we're the only either woman or person of color at our jobs. And so the black tax and you have to perform better and more is expected of you. And you're looked at differently. And I wanted her to experience all those things and all those frustrations and all those joys of being African-American in America. How often do you hear that from black women that... I feel like this is me or some part of me or someone I know because I feel maybe that's why because I, I think we, we, we know some of the same people yeah. and I, Lou Norton is so familiar to me. <laughs> yeah, every black woman who reads it sees herself in there. She sees her mother. She sees her relationships with uh, the people at her job, um, everywhere. And it doesn't matter the age. It has, you know, in some ways, you know, older women see themselves in the mom, but they do see glimpses of their younger selves in Lou and just 
feeling exhausted and sometimes angry all the time and sometimes helpless. And, you know, I've even had white women who see themselves in her in some ways because sometimes they're the only woman at work or they're involved with a marriage that just isn't working but they want to keep at it. So, yeah, no, Lou is an every black woman. And I'm so happy that she resonates with people because, you know, she, she truly resonates with me. She, like I said, she is me, but she isn't. Um, she, she cares more about, you know, helping people in some ways than I do. <laughs> and that's good. We need those types. And, um, you know, her origin story is, you know, she came from a, a, a family who her sister was taken and her father left. And many of us, well, our, some of us have our families are, in structure, are still in structure, but there's still like things that happen between our parents that we don't know about. And it isn't until you get into a relationship that you start seeing glimpses of that in your own life. So, yeah, I got to go many places with Lou and, and figure out what I thought and believed and what scared me and ways that I wanted to fix things and how some things just can't be fixed. She was the perfect vehicle for that. So it, you mean things that you wanted to change and fix in real life? In real life, um, like I write crime, but you know some of the websites and some of the news stories terrify me. And as someone who wants to know how to avoid things and avoid being a victim and... <laughs> You know, learning from others' mistakes, she was the person, she was the character that I could figure that out for all of us, you know? So, yeah, so in real life, she was, yeah, she was like a tutor for me. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about Detective Eloise Norton, a character in the Lou Norton series. I love Lou. If you haven't read any books with her as the lead character, like Land of Shadows and Skies of Ash, for example, check them out, and you can find links at planetnow.com. Now let's get to some other characters who are oh so serious with some hard backstories, but they might make you pee your pants with laughter. Again, words on a page tweaked to create these folks that I probably rode the city bus with through Los Angeles as a kid. I swear I probably saw some of these folks on the RTD. That's what it was called, Rapid Transit District, before the L.A. bus system became Metro. But before we get to the next part, you know, I have to explain this scene that made me spend minutes straight laughing my abs into shape one morning at home. I mean laughing out loud. Here's an excerpt from Halzel Hall's book, Land of Shadows, which is part of her Eloise Norton series. So a setup to this passage. Lou and her partner are looking for whoever killed a teenager named Monique Darson. Lou is an LAPD detective. She and her partner, Colin Taggart, are at an apartment building in an L.A. neighborhood known as The Jungle. So this interaction is with a person of interest named Derek. Really tall, black guy, 6'5". Half of his hair was cornrowed, the other half was in a fro. He had a Rottweiler on a leash, wore sagging shorts and a wife beater. You know, he might seem like a roughneck kind of dude. So Lou is an African-American woman, and Colin was a white guy who recently moved to the LAPD from a department in Colorado. So listen to this short interaction. And this is from Lou's point of view. Know anybody who would want to hurt Monique? I asked. Like them fools in 18th Street or somebody in the rolling 60s? Nah, Derek said, his shoulders drooping. I love that girl. She was the best thing I ever had. We always talked about escaping out of L.A. and living like them fools on Gilligan's Island. He grinned, probably imagining himself and Monique wearing grass skirts, living off apacapaca and coconut cream pie. You watch Gilligan's Island? Colin asked. Derek frowned. What? This came like Gilligan? Colin held up his hands. My bad. This short passage had me just about in tears. Why? (laughs) Well, let's talk about it. With critically acclaimed author Rachel Halzel Hall on Planet Noun. So, some of the characters... (laughs) the ones that make an appearance uh, and then you might not you know see them for a while or you might not see them again I know in uh let's see I remember the guy with the white beater I can't remember his name 
but uh, he lived Derek? in the jungle. Was his name Derek? The Gangbanger? Yes, yeah. he loved Gilligan's Derek. Island. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, I, like I don't... <laughs> For at least five minutes straight. I was at home back in, in, in Maryland uh-huh. reading this alone, probably in the wee hours of the morning. Uh-huh. And when he said, What? It's the King Mike Gilligan. I loved him. And I loved, well, because, you know, especially out here, you have like thugs say dude and wear vans. So there's this like weird juxtaposition of black people. You know, we are incredible and strange and unpredictable. And watch Gilligan's Island, you know? (laughs) Yeah, that was, and that's the the fun part of the, and that's why, you know, writers are vampires. We'll come somewhere like, like this place where we are and we'll just watch people and watch habits and what they're looking at on their phones and jam them all together to create these characters who are like, yeah, I know that guy. The guy in the wife beater with the half cornrowed hair with I Love Lucy on his TV because grandma used to watch I Love Lucy, you know? I grew up, you know, I grew up in the jungle and uh, did I have it? Someone had a Donnie and Marie lunch pail. You know, I liked Captain and Tennille who Captain died on last week. And I like the Captain. You know, it's like my iPod, my um, playlist right now, I go from Jay-Z to Elton John to, you know, not R. Kelly because fuck R. Kelly. (laughs) But it's just all these different things that mix up the African-American experience and then throw in the California experience. Totally Which is totally layer. right. I mean, out here, like I said, we say dude and hella, and it's it's a weird, weird thing. And we have great characters out here, and I love creating, you know, unpredictable people in my pages. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. And my husband's in on it. Whenever he hears or sees something that's like incredibly interesting, he will text me, and I will keep it in my Evernote. Uh, fold, folders so that I can pull it out later. I have a folder called um, Only in LA and that's where I keep interesting things and pictures of, of people because I want those people to be in my books. Yeah. Donnie and Marie lunch pail. That's Donnie hilarious. Mm-hmm. I went to school with a little boy who had, this was when we were in kindergarten, he had a Kiss lunch pail. That's how I found out about Kiss. And I was wondering, well, well, they're scary looking clowns. Oh Whenever Kiss was on like chips, I couldn't watch that episode because they scared me. I worked, okay, when I was 30, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I thought, I thought I wanted to be in entertainment like my husband is. And so I worked for a week at the WB channel as an executive assistant. And I got a phone call. It was for my boss. And the guy says, this is Gene Simmons. I'm like, oh, so she's not here. And he's like, don't you know who I am? I'm not thinking like Gene Simmons with the long tongue, but... I'm like, uh, you said your name was Gene. Is that J E A N or G? And he ran me up and down, and it was awful. He like basically screamed at me on the phone. That job kind of sucked because it just wasn't my environment. Here I am, a writer, and I was in this meeting, and they're like, "How can we get kids to watch more TV?" I'm like, "Well, I want them to read. Why am I here?" And I got my yogurt at the end of that day, and I left. I never went back. <laughs> That's going to be my next question. Did, mm. <laughs> yeah, I never went back. I cried in the car at lunchtime because it just wasn't me. And here I am trapped in this situation. And my husband's like, quit. And so I did. Like I said, I took my, my yogurt. I actually had an apple. My yogurt and apple. And at 4 o'clock, I was gone. Didn't look back. Didn't look back. My heart is in nonprofit. That's who I am. I mean, if... I'm going if I'm going to have to work full time, I want to do it while helping people. And it's that's that's where I'm I feel good. That's where I do my best work. And I've been fortunate enough in the last few drops to be able to combine uh, fundraising with writing so that I'm a fundraising writer. 
So that's actually kind of helped me crank out more of my own books. It's taught me to write on a dime and not to be so precious with words and just get it done. And it gives me um, more people to look at. You know, you can't get email battles about who stole my cream and how to kill a mouse. That was actually an email chain when I was at the ACLU. We had a mouse and ways to kill it humanely elicited like a days long email train because people wanted to buy, get a cat some people were allergic to cats we couldn't do a trap it just went on and on I'm like this is great this is crazy we're all crazy people you can't do that at home if I'm home writing by myself I can't get stuff like that that's, that's like gold there was a woman who had who used to wear little barrettes in her hair this is a grown woman like 50 something who wear little barrettes in her hair like the flat one? Yeah. Or the plastic one? Yes and yes. Oh. <laughs> you can't, she's not in my house. I need to see her so that I can... She hasn't found her way into um, a page yet, but that's what Evernote's for. So one day, she, the woman with the barrettes will be in my, in my book. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus with um, having a full-time job, I don't have to create in order to eat. No, there's never that uh, pressure to write a story because I need a paycheck. So it's always, you know, even though it is a job, it's still a joy to come to this and say, I can't do it today because I have 30,000 things to do and, you know, I just can't. And I still get a paycheck, you know. So it's, day jobs are good for that. If you had to do that for... A paycheck. Um, Would that stifle some of your creativity, you think? Or, like, if you were, like, really, really pressed, like, I'm going to lose my house if I don't do X, Y, Z. I think it would stifle my creativity because I'd be writing to uh, sell, writing stories that I know would be commercially viable and that are au courant and not necessarily what I want and the people I want to explore in the areas of town that you know, I, I want to delve into. So, yeah, I think it would. Um, I think it would become a, a drudge and a burden. And, yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be good. So, That's interesting because um, sometimes I hear folks say, you know, they would want to do something that they really love, that they're really passionate about full time. But what I'm hearing you say is kind of the opposite. I have somewhere to go. I get, you know, get ideas put them in Evernote, they'll come out in a story, or they'll make it to a page sooner or later, but you do this when you want, so it's still a joy. Well, of course, if I was rich or, you know, financially stable, I'd love to do this full time, but right now I have too much to think about. I have private school tuition, house note, we have all these things, and we like going to dinner Friday and Saturday nights. And so there's a lifestyle we must maintain that, you know, it's nice to have my salary in addition to his. But I think, you know, I still maybe want to do something part-time, only because when I'm at home, I eat a lot. (laughs) So you don't get to exercise. And again, having interesting characters are very important to me. And again, you can't meet those people at home. So I still think I do something outside of my home, even if I were wealthy. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, if that means being a contract writer for two or three days out of the week, I'd do that. So, yeah. You're listening to Planet Noun and our guest, critically acclaimed author Rachel Housel Hall. She's always been a writer, but it was a journey toward crime fiction. We talk more about that path. So I was looking at your website bio, the one on uh, rachelhousel.com, and one thing I picked out is that um, you weren't always a crime fiction writer. That's something that you kind of developed into, if that that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I picked out a couple of things, or actually a few things, that if you have any type of goal in life, and I was thinking about specifically writing, but it can apply to anything, that what whatever you want, you have to pursue it. It's not going to just fall in your lap. <laughs> when you realize you don't know something that will help you reach that goal, you have to go out and learn it, figure it out. 
and whatever you want to improve you have to practice which is you know essentially things we've been taught as we've been growing up um what what led you to i know you said you definitely um became a crime fiction writer after you know some some health challenges um was that is that something that you've always wanted to do since you were a kid or did it kind of develop as you honed writing skills and grew and developed more Um, i knew i leaned toward uh darker stories um even in high school uh, my english teacher at at linwood academy (laughs) would write all my stories why so dark you need a better ending and I hated those endings. And, you know, just to get my grade, I would troll her and write these over-the-top stories, which she's A+. Plus. I'm like, oh, please. This is awful. But, you know, here's what you wanted. So I was always interested in those kind of stories that seemed off track and a little scary. And my very first book that was published, it was um, A Quiet Storm. And while it wasn't a crime story or a mystery, it was still psychological suspense because, um, one, it was a story about a family in Los Angeles who the sister is suffering from bipolar disorder. And the premise of that story is bad things happen when we ignore bad things happening. And the character in that story with the bipolar disorder, Ricky, her husband disappears. And so they're trying to figure out what happened to Matt, and it's related to her illness. And while, again, it wasn't an out-and-out crime story, I think um, Simon & Schuster called it psychological suspense. There was still death, and there was still destruction, and there were still very sad things that happened, and that's just naturally me. Now, I'm not necessarily a morose person, but I like figuring out what makes people sad and how to fix their sadness and the origins of their sadness and that, I guess that's just my natural kind of tendency um, it wasn't until later that I learned how to write a procedural meaning um, a, a, a cop story and I stayed away from procedurals because you know you do have to have some specialized knowledge about procedure and forensics and DNA and interviewing and all that stuff. And I didn't know those things. And fortunately, with um, the genre that I write, there are lots of conferences and a lot of cops and uh, FBI agents and those types who also write mystery and crime stories. And they're very open to sharing all that they know. So that's how I got that knowledge. I went to those conferences and I interviewed people and I learned those things and then set about writing Lou. So that kept me for a long time from thinking I could actually write, you know, the story that I've always wanted to write. But, yeah, I, I, it sounds weird, but I like crime because I think it's a great equalizer. Everyone's affected by it. Everyone's a victim. You know, sometimes justice is fleeting. It's unexplainable sometimes. For instance, Friday night, people were killed at the bowling alley in, in Torrance. Okay, so let's pause right here right quick. This episode was recorded back in January, a day or two after a fatal shooting at a bowling alley in Torrance, California. Now, three people died there, four others were hurt, and arrest was made. And if you want any links to that story, you can find out more at planetnown.com. But for now, let's get back to our talk with Rachel Housel Hall, critically acclaimed author and my guest on Planet Now. You know, my daughter has been to that bowling alley, and she's been to that laser tag uh place right next door to it. It's somewhere you go for birthday parties. And here we have now three people who were shot and killed because of some argument over who knows what. And that's terrifying and compelling because now everyone's life has changed. My life has changed because now it's like if there's a party there, even though this was an isolated thing, if there's a party there, would I let my daughter go? And then who are these families? Who was the shooter? That is compelling stuff. And that's why there are like 30 iterations of Law & Order, SUV and VSI and all, you know, all these different types of crime shows because everyone's affected by it. Um, Fortunately, 
you know, I will have stories forever because crime is perpetual. It's just, it just is. And while it terrifies me, again, when I'm writing, sometimes I peek through my fingers. It still helps me understand people and helps me look at people in certain ways, um, signs and symptoms of, I don't know, of someone who may be potentially dangerous. I kind of know some things because I'm reading books about it. I'm reading psychology studies about certain aspects of sociopathy. So it's terrifying, fine, but at the same time educating. Um, it's exhausting in some ways because, you know, my daughter and I will be walking somewhere and I'm writing a bad story in my head about that car coming towards us and hopping the curb and killing, but, you know, those kind of, you can't turn it off sometimes because you're always looking for the bad thing. But, you know, you create these characters where you feel hopeful. Lou is someone that, it's like, I wish all cops were like Lou, who would stay on a case until it was solved or until someone had some type of closure. There's never total closure, but at least you know she's working for you. You know, and I think that's why most of us write crime fiction, so that in hopes that there are people like the characters we're writing about are looking out for us. So a little background about Rachel and a tidbit about me too. We grew up in the same denomination, a pretty conservative one, in the same city, went to some of the same schools, actually went to school with her younger sister. So how in the world did she reconcile how she grew up in the church? with the content of her books. Mm-hmm, honey, I love this discussion. Let's get back to Rachel Housel Hall, critically acclaimed author, episode 15 guest on Planet Now. How does your, you know, your background, um, growing up in the jungle from churches, we both raised Seventh-day Adventists, um, went to some of the same schools. How does that affect... Um, your your writing or how does that affect what you think about your writing because you know there's cursing I, I love it I love it <laughs> but you know the the little ladies with the white gloves and the little netting and the deaconess outfits might say something different oh yeah no my first book I was a little scared because you know like you said I, I while my household was liberal in itself you know I did grow up a church kid and so I was scared of cursing in my books and having sex in my books, and I worried what people thought. But as I got older and realized that these people, when they go home, have fucked up lives, how I am simply reflecting what's going on in their house. And they can read it. They can't read it. It doesn't matter to me. I have a story to tell, and this is the truth, and this is my truth. So that, you know... My, my fear fell away as I got older and cared less about them. But my background colors everything that I write about because I um, grew up working class, but I had like rich church friends, school friends. And so I'd go from you know a household where you wash your dishes and you have to turn the cups upside down because you don't want you know, roaches and stuff in the cups to, you know, nice houses with BMWs and, and Mercedes Benzes. So I lived in kind of two worlds. And a lot of my characters have that kind of dual existence on top of the dual existence of being black in America, where our default is white. So dual existence within a dual existence is almost every one of my stories. And that's fun because you can go so many places and talk about so many things and have so many references that it just colors my writing. Um, I also like writing about being in that part of town and being a family that was aspirational, and that affects me still. You know, people look at poor folks or working-class folks and assume that they're a certain way. And I like writing to say, no, they're not what you think they are. They are hardworking people who do go to church, who have jobs, who are here because of economics. My parents have four kids, 
And I remember driving around with them in the 70s, my mom with the Century 21 listing of rentals with the highlighter. And there are places that didn't rent to kids or still didn't rent to black people. And so we landed on Santo Tomas because that's where we could afford and that's where we could live. And that's, you know, that was just a fact. And, you know, growing up, of course I was embarrassed by that because, you know, again, my friends' dads are doctors and we're not, we're far from that. But at the same time, you know, I I got to peek into places and I remember saying I wanted to live live up the hill. And I did that. I live less, what, maybe two miles from where I grew up. But I still pass by it every day. And it's still, I still think about living down there every day because that's where I started telling stories. That's where I started paying attention to people and paying attention to characters and being in this apartment with a view of the Hollywood Hills and from my kitchen. You know, it's a weird existence, you know? So, yeah, it it's a part of all that I write. Yeah, growing up black in South Los Angeles is, that's my story. That's definitely in Lou's character. Uh-huh. And even with um, the new book, They All Fall Down, uh, the character Miriam, uh, she lived in Ladera Heights, which is the fancy part of black los angeles but with a divorce she's now living uh east of there and it's not necessarily a great neighborhood and the helicopters and all that and she misses her fancy life in ladera heights and you know she's going to be the story is seven ugly americans are taken to a private mexican island and are killed one by one a la agatha christie's and then there were none so while she is the main character, she's not a good character. So, but she still reflects, you know, that aspirational, striving Los Angeles Black American that I include in all my stories. And so they all fall down. That's going to be that's April, right? Mm-hmm. April 9th. It will be out April 9th. And again, while it's an Agatha Christie story, and Agatha Christie is very British and very uh, driven by class. This story is very American and driven by everything, class, race, sexuality, all of it. I am an equal opportunity uh, killer of characters in this book. (laughs) Because that's who we are as America. You're listening to Rachel Halzel Hall, critically acclaimed author, and she has a new book coming out in April. It's called They All Fall Down. Honey, it is a page turner. So earlier we talked about writer's angst. Now let's talk about Rachel's most gratifying moments as an author and how she gets it all done with a full-time job. Our final part for this episode of Planet Noun with special guest Rachel Halzel Hall. Of course, a gratifying moment is seeing my book actually in print on a bookshelf somewhere. Um, when I get to sign them, that's a dream. Uh, whenever my agent or editor emails me for anything, whenever I see Kristen Sevick or Jill Marshall's name in my inbox, it thrills me because I have an agent and an editor. Um, one of the biggest was being contacted by James Patterson's editor to co-write a story with him. That's kind of, that's one of those, I must know how to do something when James Patterson's editors reach out to me and ask if I was interested in co-writing a story with him. You know, I tend to forget that. But then when I do remember, I'm like, damn, I, I must be able to do something because he just doesn't call anybody. Um, when my daughter tells me that she's proud of me. Now, I, I always sometimes, you know, the mom guilt and feeling guilty for going to conferences or writing somewhere without her, I feel guilty. As moms, you know, that's just a thing. Moms feeling guilty. We will feel guilty to the end of the earth. But when she says that she's happy for me or that she's proud of me and that she's glad that I'm doing this certain thing, I feel really good about myself. Because I know she's paying attention. And that's one reason why I'm still doing this. Because I want her to see that she can be someone's mom and someone's wife and someone's 9 to 5 
but still have this piece of her that is her and authentically her, whatever that is, she can still keep it. She may be a little tired, but it's still there, and she can do whatever that is that she's dreamed of, you know, forever. And mommy did it, so I can do it too. So I'm modeling for her, and that makes me feel good. Do you still write in your car? You know, actually, I do. Um, I write in my car when uh, my daughter's at practice, soccer practice, and I'll get my steps in, and then I'll go back to my car, and I'll write. Now that I have an office at work, I don't have to go to my car at lunchtime and early in the mornings like I used to, uh, but I still, when there's traffic and I'm driving, I will have my notepad or Post-its, and yes, I will write as as I'm driving because there's traffic. It's four or five. You're not going anywhere, so I might as well get some thoughts in. So, yeah, my car is my, my second office. Yeah. And every bit of time is being used <laughs> in a wise way. <laughs> every bit of time. You know, there are writers who say, you know, I just don't have time. Yeah, you do. You do have time. That 15 minutes before your doctor's appointment, I write. That practice time, I write. Traffic, I write. Any little gaps of time, I write. And, yeah, it's going to take me longer than some writers who get to have these long blocks of time. But I've, I've published, you know, eight books now doing exactly that. So I want to hear this I don't have time thing because, yeah, you do. It's just a matter of how you want to use that time. And, like, this morning I got up at 5 o'clock to write. And I wrote until eight thirty nine 9 o'clock. And that's when the house wakes and I do laundry and cook breakfast and all the rest of it. But, yeah, you, it's like eating an elephant one bite at a time. It's going to take some time, but you will eat the elephant. The elephant's going to get eaten. So you might as well do it in, in little blocks. That is, if you really want it to, to happen. Thanks for listening to Planet Nan, where it's all about the people, places, things, and ideas that teach us, prompt us to make a difference, and do more with what life presents. So today's guest, critically acclaimed author Rachel Halzel Hall, she wrote the Lude Norton crime fiction series, which I love, and we get to meet another one of her characters in April when her latest book, They All Fall Down, is released. That'll be April 9, to be exact. Now read more, get Rachel's website links and book information and social media handles, and more at planetnow.com. I'm Liz Anderson, host of the Planet Now podcast. Don't forget to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music. Stop on by, leave a comment, and rate the show. Now, if you have interview ideas, folks who are doing the most to make a difference where they're planted, or folks with an interesting story, story, please drop me an email, planetnoun at gmail.com. Thanks again for stopping by, and until next time, take care.